So just as we start uh, to let you all know that we will be recording this and it'll be available later for you on our YouTube channel. Um, my name is Zoe Forster. I'm Lakota Kendall. And welcome to How to Be a Creative and Make Loads of Money. <laughs> so just as we're beginning, oh sorry, just add somebody else. Um, just before we begin, um, if I could do a little bit of housekeeping, if you could keep your cameras on and your microphones off, you are of course absolutely encouraged to ask questions, um, but there'll be time to do this after each artist has spoken and you can put your questions in the chat as well and we'll keep an eye on that. So cameras on, microphones off please. Okay, so first off we've got Richard Dedon... De Dominici, sorry Richard, I get that wrong every it's, single time. It's um, fine. Richard is well known. Say again. Um, it's a common, it's a common problem. My surname. It's a common problem for me as well. <laughs> so Richard is really well known for his work, karaoke, and the Corona Vision Song Contest. He's also quite well known for dressing up as an Olympic torchbearer and running through the streets of London with crowds cheering and the police chasing after him. So welcome, Richard. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to try and... Oh dear, my background video is not working. That's very upsetting. <laughs> Um, I had a background video with the loads of uh, footage of my work, but you'll just just imagine it. And I do have some pictures I can share. Um, right. um, now, I don't actually call myself a creative. Um, originally, the title of this talk was how to be an artist um, and make lots of money. So I'll be speaking from that perspective, but hopefully it's transferable. Uh, the good news is the first half of the question, how to be an artist, is easy. Um, because I think anyone can be an artist. Uh, you don't even have to go to art school. Um, I might just see if I can show you a picture. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Wish me luck. Um, here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's no good. Help. Richard whilst, Richard, whilst you're finding that, I'm just going to introduce the rest of the creatives who are involved in this Zoom call. Yes, please do. Yes, yeah, so we've got we've got Bart Van Peel from the Captain Boomer Collective in Belgium. You might know Bart from taking a whale to Red Car Beach, but also Whitehaven Harbour. Welcome, Bart. He's up there. His audio's <laughs> off. <laughs> and also Hi, Pineapple. Guys. Hey guys, morning. <laughs> and also Pineapple Black Gallery of Middlesbrough. Now, the thing I love the most about Pineapple Black Gallery is that they keep their space totally open and reactive, you know, so they can respond to current events that are happening in the world. Um, for example, last time I spoke to them, they were collecting donations for the war in Ukraine. So welcome Stephen Irvin from Pineapple Black Gallery. Hi. So, that, that did, that did. Eden Arts have organised this creative network meeting as part of the 66 project. So the 66 project works across the regions of the A66, which is North and West Cumbria, Tees Valley and County Durham. We've got Celia and Adrian here with Eden Arts to have a bit more information on that later on. Hi Celia, hi Adrian. <laughs> So Eden Arts are an artist led company. We are based in Penrith um, and we work to facilitate and create change through arts and cultural events. Anyway, that's enough from us. Um, as I said earlier, if you could keep your cameras on and your microphones off, there will be time to have a bit of a chat later on. But just while people are talking, that'd be really useful. I'll pass it over to Richard now. Richard, how's your screen coming? It's going really well, thank you very much. I'm going to try and share a picture now. Did that work? What can yeah. you see, everybody? Can you see lots of pictures or can you see one picture? We can copy one. one. Or does, it, does it show a poster with some words yeah. on it? I think the general okay, consensus. Cool. Yeah. All right, that's very good news. Um, I can't see that poster, but I'm glad that you can. Um, so, um, yes, uh, it's easy to be an artist. Anyone can be an artist. You don't have to go to art school even. Um, here's a poster I made on this topic. Uh, embarrassingly, I think I plagiarised a quote from Picasso. Um, I often seem, 
uh, other people's work and consider it plagiarism, even though I haven't thought of that idea yet. Um, and um, that's another tip about how to make lots of money is to plagiarize. It's all right because, um, you know, were it not for professional rivalry, I'd probably never get any work done. So the threat of imminent plagiarism can be an excellent motivational factor. But it's fine because once you reach a certain stage in your artistic career, people will start to ask you to come and give talks to their students. So if you don't have any ideas of your own, um, you can just steal all of their ideas and thus the cycle of creativity continues. Um, I'm based in Watford, which is on the edge of London in, uh, in the south. But I was born in Hexham in the north, in, in Northumberland. Um, and I've made uh, various bits of work with Eden Arts, including a remake of some scenes from With Nail and I at the original um, cottage in which it was filmed. And um, that was our first work together. I've also made quite a lot of work at uh, Mintfest in Kendall in Cambria, um, including um, a remake of some scenes from Dawn of the Dead in the shopping centre there. Uh, and um, this is all part of a project called the Redux Project, which I've been doing for about nine years now. And uh, it also happened in Red Car um, at the Festival of Thrift. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the Redux project later. I started off uh, making, I studied fine art, but I was in a strange department in Cardiff School of Art called the Time-Based Department. Um, my first piece of performance involved blowing up balloons in a telephone box until it became completely full, which took about two hours. And uh, it was a very cheap performance, about seven pounds it cost. Um, it was in the street, it required no tech or venue even, and um, was quite visually spectacular. And a woman called Lois came along, she walked by and saw it and said, would you like to come and present this at the National Review of Live Art in Scotland? And I didn't know what that was, but I said yes. Um, and then when I was there, a man called Anthony saw it and said, uh, would you like to come and make some work at the Edinburgh Festival? And so that's kind of how my career started, by mistake, um, just by... Um, accidents a series of happy accidents and most of those places like the nola um and the time-based department car school of art they no longer exist so um, unfortunately it's impossible to follow directly in my footsteps but don't worry because um i don't recommend following in my footsteps that's one of my key recommendations today um So I used to make lots of work in the street and uh, it would often be one off work. I'd make a performance once and then I'd never do it again because I always wanted to do new things. And uh, I don't recommend this. If you want to make lots of money, don't do that. Um, I recommend instead repeating your work over and over again, the same piece. Um, it's a pragmatic solution and it's a labor saving strategy, but also people get confused if you do different things all the time. Um, and it makes it very difficult for you to pigeonhole and thus understand. So I've been transitioning to um, more of a model where I do the same piece of work over and over again, um, albeit one that never feels boring because it's always a new challenge in a new place with new people. And it's called the Redux Project, which I've already mentioned. Um, I still do other independent individual pieces, but this has become a kind of ongoing franchise, the franchise model. I recommend the franchise model. I was always very cynical about the franchise model, um, but it's true that some artists only need to have one idea to be a success because they can just repeat it over and over again. This is only really um, acceptable if it's a good idea, I feel. But, you know, you can just go around the world repeating the same piece of art until you've exhausted the global art centre infrastructure, by which time everyone will have probably forgotten what the idea was in the first place and you can start doing it again and so on until you're dead. Um, some artists are even able to, to subcontract their work out to other people to do on their behalf, which I've, I've yet to completely figure that one out, but that's my next stage, I think. Um, I've always had quite a strong ethical policy about who I will or won't take money from or work with. Um, don't do that. If you want to make lots of money in art, don't lower your ethical standards. Um, recently, my ethical policy has become a little bit more flexible. The Redux project, which I've already mentioned many times, um, has a much lower ethical policy than the rest of my artistic practice. So I've got different ethical policies within my different pieces of work, which I'm not sure if that's allowed but that's what i've been doing recently so for instance domino's pizza gave me 50 pizzas um, in exchange for putting their branding in a redux and i said okay because that means i can feed all my cast and crew um which i would never normally do such a thing from a multinational corporation but you know it was a good pragmatic solution um don't be a dick um 
it's important if you want to make lots of money in art not to be a dick um i was a dick i was a dick a couple of years ago to adrian actually and i thought he'd never work with me again um but he's very thank very kindly offered offered to uh, let me do some more stuff with him what so thanks adrian. What, what, what did you do, do you remember you we were going to do that thing about um groundhog day and then I, then I, I got angry. It was in the pandemic. I was freaking out. It was like two months, three months into the pandemic. And I was like, you know, going a bit mad. And I, I accused Adrian of, you know, I said, you need to pay me more money, Adrian. I can't do all this work for, and, um, and then we didn't speak for about oh, a year. And I thought that's it. We're never, we're oh. never going to, well, Adrian clearly can't remember this, but I remember it extremely well. Don't be a dick basically is my, <laughs> is my advice. I, I, I did a project for the BBC a few years ago in uh, 2015, actually quite a few years ago. And, um, uh, the fame went a bit to my head and I became a dick for about two years and I treated people badly and uh, lost a lot of friends. Don't do that. Be nice. Be generous. Be kind if you want to make a lot of money in art. Um, multiple revenue streams. Um, it's quite good if you can get some kind of recurring passive income from your work. Like I make performance art. It's not the kind of work you can sell very easily. Um, but I do make uh, little books, which I occasionally try to. So, oh, that's blurred out, it's blurred out. It's, con it's a controversial book, that's why. Um, uh, so, yeah, some kind of passive income is good because what if you have an accident when you're doing a piece of performance art and you can't work for several days and you don't have any insurance or a pension? Um, so, some kind of recurring merchandise is quite good. I know some artists who do sex work. Um, that's one way to make a lot of money whilst being an artist live inexpensively this is another way to not make lots of money but to save spending lots of money um i live in on the hinterland of london um i eat mostly food from the reduced to clear section in supermarkets um i don't have any recurring subscriptions and so i generally try to live a rich life but cheaply um i don't have children i don't have a car i don't go on holiday but many people say richard your whole life is a holiday so try and live inexpensively and that that's a good alternative to making lots of money um getting paid is an important thing to do if you want to make lots of money i've always been quite bad at uh asking for the right fee um if you're not a member already i'd recommend joining um an artist newsletter they not only have really good um in public liability insurance which can come in use um, but they also publish um, recommended rates for artists and it's something I discovered a few years ago and now I can say to people you're not that's not enough um, or these are the recommended rates for the, for doing two days of work with my number of years of experience and you can show them a physical thing and then you know that that really helps in getting paid properly um, sometimes I pretend to be my own agent if you haven't got an agent you know you can just pretend to be your own agent I don't really want an agent because they get you work that you don't necessarily want to do and they pressurize you into doing it and they take 15 percent pretend to be your own agent um that's one piece of advice uh be generous you know it's okay to do stuff for free my policy is that it's okay to do stuff for free if the people organizing the thing that you're doing aren't making any money but if they're making money if they're selling tickets then you should have some of that money too that's tends to be on my policy so i often ask if that's the case um don't say yes to everything you're offered it's very flattering to be offered to do stuff um, but if you say yes to everything, you can end up doing 50 things a year and over trading and not making any money from any of it. Um, it's OK to say no and it's OK to explain why. And it's OK to send people a list, a table showing how much you should be paid. I've got a link to that, which I can post in the comments if anyone would like to see that, because um, otherwise your work can become unsustainable. Your practice can become unsustainable. Um, do make art for so long that it's impossible for you to do anything else. Um, then you're forced into doing art forever. Um, I've been making work for 20 years ago, uh, for 20 years now, and it's impossible for me to go and get a job in a shop, um, big, even though I'd quite like to, uh, because I've got this very suspicious looking 20 year gap in my CV and um, I'm not very good at taking instructions from people. Uh, the closest I came to making lots of money was um, when I applied with some other artists in the east of England for £500,000 um, to make some work during the Olympiad, the cultural Olympiad. We lost, we came second. Um, somebody else got the £500,000. We got a little bit of money to make the work we wanted to do from the Arts Council, but not as much. Um, and actually that work, because it because we had to put logos and we, it felt a bit compromised. And actually the best piece of work I made in 2012 was the fake torch performance, which cost nothing. I just said, put me up if 
in your on your sofa and buy me a train ticket if you want me to come and bring my fake torch to your town and lots of people said yeah come and bring your fake torch and it was uh, the torch was made from a bit of sequin waste which cost about five pounds very inexpensive sometimes the best work costs almost exactly nothing um i think really the best way to make lots of money um by being an artist is to give talks to other people about how to make lots of money and charge for those talks um a bit like a kind of youtube scam um so that's my next uh, idea thank you for giving me it eden arts um a pyramid scheme in conclusion um don't make non-object based work that you can't sell uh don't make different bits of work all the time uh consider the franchise model um write down all the ideas that you have because you'll probably have all your best ideas when you're young um do your easiest ideas first it can be soul destroying when somebody else does your idea before you. It's fine to fail. You can do it again. Uh, I've made a whole lecture about failure. Uh, have a flexible ethical policy. Don't be a dick. Um, and mostly make the work you want to make. Do what you love. Find what you love to do. Do it to the best of your ability. And then you'll be happy and you can leave a rich life, even if not monetarily. Finally, take everything I've just said with a pinch of salt. Thank you very much. I've been Richard Delamanici. Well, thank you very much, Richard. That was, I don't know what to say. That was fantastic. <laughs> I'm lost for words. So if you've got any questions for Richard, now's your time. Turn your mics off, have a bit of a chat. Um, or put them in the chat if you're not comfortable talking in front of loads of people. Um, We will wait. Nobody ever wants to go first, but we will wait. <laughs> so, so, Rich, did you make loads of money out of the Redux then? No. Um, even when it was on the BBC, I think uh, like the whole budget for the whole show was big. It was like £250,000, but the BBC managed about £220,000 of that. That was all the cameras and equipment and stuff. I got about 30 grand from which I had to build all the props, pay all the uh, performers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe I got to keep about seven or eight of it for myself, but that project took about six months to make. So it was it was paid. It was quite well paid for me, but still it wasn't huge amounts. And people are sometimes shocked when they hear how little money um, I made out of that project. Um, but the Redux project in general, it's so scalable, it can be a really, it can cost nothing and take a few minutes or it can be huge. So the, the scalability of it is really useful and it's participatory and it's, um, uh, it's participatory and it's site specific and it's cheap. So people really like the Redux project. I only, I only was supposed to do it once and then I've done almost a hundred of them now all around the world. Um, and so that can scale like the current one i'm doing has got a budget of about 30 grand which is that's a lot for me even again i won't get to keep much of it because i'll spend most of it on costumes and props and stuff but um it can it's good to make work that's scalable do you do you, do you put yourself through um uh, grant applications what like the arts council and stuff yeah yeah no not really i i kind of i've always wanted to try and not depend on the arts council directly anyway although i do secondarily from other sources like this i imagine uh, if you trace it back um but i've never really been one to do big applications just because i think the government might cancel it the arts council at any moment they've all, they've already stopped using the word art the arts council so i think it's inevitable that they'll just rename it the creative council and won't give money to artists anymore so i've always been paranoid about that so i've not ever done that but maybe i should apply to the arts council that's a good bit of advice so we can see Rosie's got a question. We can yeah. Showing, showing his screen. To, to, to see Am I still screen. showing my screen? Yeah. You are. Yeah. Was it's I showing boring. my screen for that whole thing? Yeah, it was yeah. very boring. Did you not <laughs> see my face? Yeah, we could. I was doing some really good facial expressions. I'm so sorry. Never mind. Just so Rosie, what would, what would you like to say? Um, I just wanted to ask, um, do you think it's important where you live as an artist? I mean, because you live in London, do you think that gives you an advantage or do you think these days with the internet and everything, it doesn't really matter? I'd, when... like, to, I'd like to think it didn't help uh, where you live. Like, I'd love to just be able to, I don't think, I think it's less and less important, I would say. Um, it depends on the kind of work you make. If it's, if it's the kind of work that you have to be at the place to do it, then it helps, you know, not to live in the middle of nowhere. But really, Depending on your kind of creative work, yeah, you could live anywhere. You could live in a really cheap place and just, if you've got a laptop and you can work from a laptop, then yeah, I would recommend that. I've always wanted to do that. I've got too much stuff. Don't have loads of stuff. 
<laughs> what do you think, Rosie, uh, about place, about where you are, whether it makes a difference? Um, I think, I mean, because I'm based in Carlisle, um, I sort of like, you know, I get involved with local stuff and, you know, and it's been quite good to me, actually, being a Cumbrian artist. I imagine that there's less competition here than in London <laughs> per square mile <coughs> of creativity. Well, yeah people you know certainly living in Watford is good because you're not in London so you're not the London Arts Council but you are 15 minutes from London yeah so sometimes living on board a border of some sort can really be useful well I imagine like you know Carlisle probably isn't very high on the Arts Council's funding list in some ways but Cumbria wide um there's plenty going on you know like with um, Route 66 and uh you know like just the various um main galleries and things going around. So it's quite interesting. But um, if you don't want to make artwork about landscape, it can be quite challenging, I think, being in Cumbria. <laughs> I know the Arts Council have got a list of cultural cold spots. Um, and I know some artists that have moved to those cultural cold spots just because it's possible to get more money there. So, you know, a lot of nomadic artists go specifically to where there's funding and then move somewhere else, which is a crazy way to live. It's like being in the circus. Yeah, well, seven, is, seven of the oh. ten districts, seven of the ten districts in the 66 project, um, not Route 66, Rosie, really, because if we call it Route 66, it would be buried on page 56 on the uh, sorry about on the, that on, on the Google <laughs> search. Um, but seven of the ten districts, uh, Allerdale, Copeland, Carlisle, Eden, County Durham, and the five Tees Valley ones are on that list. Um, and so, so as artists, you should always be saying that, you know, whenever if you make an application, I mean, this is the Arts Council. Um, that, that they supposedly are favouring those places, but but quite how I don't know. Well, I've, I've just put in an application for the uh, you know the develop your creative practice fund. So let's hope that helps me. <laughs> and so congratulations we're gonna... to Council Durham on their um, failed bid for culture, oh, yeah. of culture. We're going to push this on a little bit just because otherwise we'll be running out of time. Yeah, and I'm going to introduce Bart Van Peel the man who took a wheel around the world and it is still taking a wheel around the world. Hi, Bart. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks, Richard, uh, for your talk. It was sometimes very recognizable, um, some of the things you, you touched upon. I also have a, a screen to share and I'm going to do this very fluently. Okay, so... All right. All right, so I'm, I'm from Captain Boomer Collective. By the way, there is one other member of Captain Boomer here present. It's Tim and it's his birthday. He surprised me by being here. So if you see him somewhere uh, along, the, along the participants, happy birthday, Tim. So uh, both of us are part of Captain Boomer Collective and I'm the artistic director, which means that I think about uh, concepts. I'm and then also I try to make them happen um, and, uh, you know, help wherever I can to, to do that. Um, and I'm also here on behalf of the International Whale Association, which had, did an intervention in the north um, of the UK uh, about, I think it's about a month ago. Um, so on the beach of Redka, very early in the morning, uh, there was a huge carcass of a dead sperm whale found. Um, and you see the old steel factory in the background. And um, this caused quite a stir. A lot of people came uh, to see it. Um, and in Redcar, a lot of things were happening those last months. I mean, um, as you saw, the steel mill um, um, stopped. I mean, so there is like, a uh, let's say, some social issues there um, with employment. But also there was a mass um, um, beaching of dead sea animals those last month. So when everybody came together around this uh, dead carcass, a lot of questions were asked in, uh, of people, I mean, is this related? The whole community came together. Um, it's not, it's, it's something that brings a whole, uh, and that stirs a, a city. So um, this is one of our works and I took uh, Richard's advice to heart, repeat your work. And this is what actually we do because you see here that we've done the same thing in, in Paris. Um, 
um, and also other cities around uh, Europe, uh, Madrid, um, uh, London, and etc. Um, every time we, um, we 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 really explore the the borders between reality and fiction, so we make it into a true fact. I mean, there's a fence around it. There is scientists around it. So, um, true and false, I mean, actors, but also we invite real scientists. And within our fence, it is a true fact. So we just keep on um, telling people about why it died, uh, about those magnificent animals, and why it came out of its element, through itself, on the beach, and, um, and, and why it's there. We don't go into the meta talk about art. This can be done um, when you're outside of the fence. And so it's a journey for people. Um, they come to that scene. Um, they... Usually they don't know what's going on. They believe it's a real one. They they are shocked. They are sad. They are also um, cu curious and, and they have joy because they meet, uh, they, they see a whale quite often for the first time of their lives. And as the time goes, they feel, oh no, it may be not a real one. Is it a real one? They hear rumors, they check the internet. And so it's a whole journey and the emotions shift. And that's to me a very interesting thing. They maybe they are when they find out it's an, actually an art installation it's not a, an actual dead whale they become relieved you know they're relieved oh it's, it's you know but some people uh, you know find it funny so they start to laugh other people become angry they are like what are you are you fucking with me what is this and so for example in red car we had a real uh, one real aggressive um intervention of uh, a, a gentleman who was drunk and stormed the installation and and kicked the whale um and i think it's it's good because it means it it provokes this smorgasbord of emotion and at the second time also reflection uh, the reflection of the dead animal uh, you know, nature coming out of its elements, throwing it up itself at our feet and saying, basically, like, I give up, I, I can't anymore. Um, so this was done together with Eden Arts. We're so grateful we worked years to make this happen. Um, and we were all desperate uh, at some point. Um, we can go into detail uh, there if you want. But um, um, this is kind of the work of Captain Boomer. We have kind of five or six of these rather big i mean think big is a very important one for me interventions usually in the in public space where we um try to bring people together around a, a work of art confuse them move them um and hopefully also make them uh, you know reflect um for example this is another work um and it's kind of similar i'll also show you a top picture basically what you see here is um the work page two with cows and it's basically um, the other way around. And this time we have reality itself. I mean, the cows are real. And you have the typical, let's say, bucolic um, um, scene of two cows in a meadow, which has been painted throughout history for millions of times. And in this case, we actually frame it. And so we frame reality itself. Um, and people are, are invited to come and sit on that uh, golden frame this is in london i think about three years ago um and uh yeah it's, it's really a zen machine so if the, the city stops like a painting it stops the time and people take on that rhythm of of let's say of the cows that rural rhythm um this is also an installation that has been touring um and that we you know that we we do um let's say once a year uh twice a year if things go well uh, I do the, the concepts and I also do the selling of the of the shows. Um, so I'm uh, I'm doing both of these things. And then we have people who build those things. We work together with sculptors, with decor builders, with um, with uh, actors uh, uh, who who do our shows. And we're now developing uh, a new thing that we'll also bring to Eden Art, which is still top secret, I believe, uh, Adrian. So our lips are sealed um, and. Um, yeah, we did. We we also we always kind of explore the border between art and reality, and I, that's what I recognized in in Richard's work. Um, this is interesting. I mean, also public sp public space is interesting. It's one of the last places where you know you're not in 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 a box or in a screen, so it's it's a uh, it's a really great environment to do stuff. Um, and then uh, yeah try to push that border between what is real, what is not real, and look for beauty, basically, yeah. Um, so I'm not going to play the... Yeah, this is maybe just one of the other concepts that we're going to do is we're going to open an embassy in, in, in palaces uh, 
um, in capitals where we open an embassy uh, of Birao. Um, now, Birao is a non-existing country, but who is like a little island in the Pacific who is about to be, uh, you know, disappear because of climate change. And out of desperation, they opened these big grand embassies around the world. And they, um, you know, they, they, they convinced people um, of, of their solutions, which are pretty far-fetched and, and crazy and dangerous. But it's also a game between fiction and reality, taking people on a journey. And in this case, again, uh, I think that the, the, the environment, the climate change is, is, is the biggest um, issue of our times. So uh, if it can be, um, if that can be the main theme, that's always welcome okay so um i didn't talk as richard as much about money but i like the quote when two bankers come together for dinner they talk about art and when two artists come together for dinner they talk about money and uh, i i always like that quote because it is true i mean artists are always complaining about money um and i'm ready i'm ready to do that with you uh, and to answer any um questions um I like Richard's suggestion, be kind, that's super important. And the ethics about the funding, I think, is also a difficult one. I mean, and, and um, yeah, maybe last thing, I think, to me, um, doing these projects, what I experience is that uh, the political correctness is sometimes an issue for me. I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, quite a lot of projects, especially the franking projects, you just have to basically do them if you're going to ask permission, if you that, that is a very difficult uh, process. So just do it, don't ask for permission, especially when we are beginning as an artist, I think is a, is a good one. Of course, we have projects with a big scale, so we need those permissions, but that's a lot of work, uh, a lot of work. And, and um, there's, a, yeah, as you know, there's so much sensitivity now around so many issues. And as an artist, they are really scrutinizing you. For example, when you use live animals, it's like, um, and so I've seen quite a lot of project break down on, on, on that, even if the intentions are good. So um, yeah, any questions uh, I'm willing to answer. I kept it brief, I think. And uh, can I, sh I'll sh stop sharing my screen. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. So yeah, now, now is your time, as Bart says, turn your microphones off and have a bit of a chat with Bart. If you've seen the whale, stuff you want to talk to him about Bart's here of course Richard is still here um, I can I can see Celia very quietly sat with her hand up so <laughs> I have a quick <laughs> question Bart um, that was oh I'm getting reverb useless utterly useless all right can you hear me Bart yes yes I can right I can't hear you um I was going to ask, um, could you tell me or us a bit more about you know, the, the route through which you got to this development stage in your practice? So kind of what what early stages could you pinpoint to, to get to where you are now? Yeah, so how it works with me um, is that once I get an idea, quite, quite often it's a big idea that's on the verge of being possible or impossible, right? Because if you tell that for the first time, like you're going to you know, put a whale in the heart of Paris, it's pretty, sounds pretty impossible. So, uh, but that needs, it needs that to activate people. You know, you need to have like a, something that seems like, well, you can't do that, but maybe, right? So this is, this is, I think, an important one to activate people. Then basically I start telling the people around me about it. Uh, I'm the great thing about Antwerp, we have a great network of, of artists and friends. Um, I'm telling them about them and, and, and hearing their opinion, who to work with, uh, are they enthusiastic? You know, and that's a very important point. Are they enthusiastic and how can you tell if, if they offer to work for free on the project, if, even if there's not any money yet, if they, if they volunteer to do that, say, okay, you know, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna do it. Then it means they, 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 um, they, you, have, you have something in your hands. Um, so then you start to, you know, talking to a lot of people about it and then you find, at a certain moment, the key people, right, that you need. Uh, in the case of the frame, it's somebody who can build that gigantic frame and a farmer. In the case of the whale, it's a brilliant sculptor. Um, we were happy to work with um, Zephyr, who is uh, actually in Belgium and is one of the, you know, world, world famous animal sculptors. And, you know, so you get to talk to those key people and you need to get them aboard, you know, convince them, okay, um, are you willing to do that? Um, so it's first the people and then it's the funding. The funding comes when you have a file which is believable for all your 
uh, you know, for the people that you need to convince someone like Adrian, for example, you know, uh, you need to convince him. Um, and you need just don't go with your first idea to a person like that. Be believable in, in your credential. Who you're going to work with is that is that credible that that the, those people will actually deliver. Um, this is kind of how I work and I still work that. Maybe Celia, important to know, and this is really important, is that um, only about one in two projects work. One in two or one in three projects actually make it, which means that there is a graveyard of failed projects, but really graveyard of expensive big projects that didn't make it because of funding, because of legislation, because of whatever. Um, it's really always a very emotional process to see a process uh, yeah, get lost. Film projects, uh, I had film project that failed or, or, or other very big projects that I put years of time in, money, uh, connections, and, and that failed. So that, that, ha that really happens and it's, it's really a graveyard and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We get that. Cheers, Mark. Yeah, I feel like this is good. So I can see Rosie nodding away there as you were as you were talking about. <laughs> oh, on, I was just interested in what you were saying before about you know like the problems you encounter. So would you say like the biggest in terms of projects not actually being completing? Would you say it was financial reasons, or would you say it was logistical reasons, or would you say it was like moral reasons? Maybe why your projects you didn't manage to get them where you wanted to be. It's always a mix. It's a mix. Um, you have money, uh, but that was. I mean, I, I was so lucky that that you know that now raising money is easier for me because of the reputation. So that's that's a big um used to be the biggest you know blocker let's say but now it, that becomes less less hard uh, still hard but less hard and then you have the permissions for together with the permission you have the m moral objections that people raise and they will do that um, because their people are careful and they can always say look i told you so so they can they can always tell you uh you know don't use real cows or for example, you're going to do an embassy of a, of a South Pacific island. You, you that's cultural appropriation. You talk for you know all these all these things people you know, come up with not to do it. And some of them are valid, some of them are not valid. Or uh, you know, um, there's so many you know uh, there's so much so much sensitivity now with with social media. So everybody's so afraid of of the bad uh, coverage of being cancelled. So I think that's that's a big one. I mean, I really experience that uh, nowadays that it's it's really, bug, you know, I have to waste my time on all, well, that's what I feel on a lot of those uh, discussions. Um, and the messenger is the message. I think that's also uh, uh, something that's very strong in our culture now. The fact that, you know, I'm, for example, like, a, you know, I'm who I am. The fact that I'm doing that is basically the message itself in this, the concept I find difficult. I mean, but it's it is what it is. It is a fact. So you need to deal with that. Um, so th those are kind of the the big ones. Yeah. Thank you. I've come across a few of those as well. <laughs> it's nice as you're talking. I can I can see you know Richard's joining in and going yeah no you're right. <laughs> so we'll uh, we'll move on for now. Yeah, and I'm going to welcome Steve Irvin here from Pineapple Black Gallery of Middlesbrough. Hello. You all right? Hi. Hi. Yes, just, you know, technology, just making sure I know what I'm doing. Yes, okay, good. Yeah, right. I you. Yeah, okay, right. Um, uh, I don't have imagery and stuff. Uh, well, I do have some photos, but God knows how I uh, show them. Uh, do you want to do this? Can people see them? Okay, so um, so I'm Stephen Irvin. I uh, co-direct a space called Pineapple Black in Middlesbrough and the Hill Street Shopping Centre um, alongside uh, Bobby Benjamin, who is a artist from the area. Um, this is Pineapple Black. This is uh, what, what we have. It is an old new look um, that had been shut for two years before we moved into it. Um, we get it via East Street Arts, which are a charity based out of Leeds. 
And, and what these street arts do is they go in, they find empty buildings and they speak to the landlords and say to them, you know, if you've let artists go in here, um, it's actually going to save you money because we're art charity and you don't have to pay the business rates and they have to pay business rates, even though there's nobody in the building and blah, blah, blah. I don't really understand all of it. But it means that um, it's cheaper for them to give us this than it is for them to keep it as an empty building. And so um, we've had Pineapple Black now since uh, November 2018. Um, we officially launched to the public in January of 2019. And we have a continuous kind of program of uh, exhibitions normally running are uh, kind of for four weeks and then we'll have a two-week gap in between um, and then we'll have another exhibition and we've done that ever since we started for as long as we are allowed to because of COVID and other restrictions but whenever we've been allowed to open we've been open. Um, that two-week period that we have in between um, the main shows that allows us um, time to open up the space and just let community groups come in, individual artists come in, musicians. Um, we have pop up events, um, poetry nights, comedy nights. Um, had a you know like a, a mum who was part of some collective of kind of mum artists who. You know, we're looking after the kids and, and, and weren't able to kind of do art all the time. It's become more of a hobby and she kind of got some more of them together and we let them take over the space and put on a, an exhibition for, for the weekend. So it allows us kind of freedom to, um, to, to, to kind of do these things and allow people to kind of come up to us um, at relatively short notice with ideas for things that they want to do. Um, the space itself consists of four separate galleries. The, the images that I have here are all of the main space. Um, but if I go, if I go back a bit, um, you might be able to see there on the right hand side, there's a, a little window area. So that's our 24 seven gallery. Um, and that runs on a separate timetable to the main space. Um, and that's a, place where artists can kind of submit a proposal and they can take over that space for two, three, four weeks um, and have that work viewed by literally tens of thousands of people every day because our location is directly opposite the car park for the Hill Street Shopping Centre and we are next door to Primark um, and Sainsbury's is on the other side. So we just have thousands of people walking past every day. So it's a really good space for artists to kind of um, to use and, um, and get their work seen by the public. We also have uh, in the back where that little kind of orange square is, um, that is what used to be the changed rooms, uh, the changing rooms for, for New Look. And it still has all of the cubicles in it. So it's a really interesting space for artists to use. It doesn't have any of the curtains or doors, but just all the like, individual booths. And then upstairs, we have a fourth space um, along with some uh, few studios and a kind of like a secret little like nightclub um, type thing, uh, which we um, kind of use for uh, like after show parties and, and, and kind of, um, little pop-up events again it's, it's got like a, a back entrance so it's uh it kind of um it, it, it feels a bit naughty when people go in because they kind of go in through the alleyway and then up some stairs and then there's like it's got like fur walls and stuff and 90s disco lights um and so we'll have like local bands playing there and uh and use the space for practice and stuff when 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 not um, so that's kind of Pineapple Black, um, but Pineapple Black is part of um, the cultural partnership in Middlesbrough. Um, and the cultural partnership in Middlesbrough um, set up a couple of years ago, and it's all of the different arts um, 
galleries and establishments and stuff across, not just Middlesbrough, but kind of Teesside and, and stuff come into it as well. Um, and what we do is the cultural partnership is, um, although we individually kind of go for our own pots of funding and things like that, um, we also go in for bigger pots of funding as a cultural partnership. Um, so recently the cultural partnership won, um, I think it was around four million pound um, of, of money to put into the infrastructure of um, creativity and culture within Middlesbrough. Um, so there's going to be lots of work going on over the next few years to kind of um, build more permanent uh, art spaces and, and, and cultural kind of uh, uses. Um, it's currently culture and creativity is like number two on Teesside's um, kind of list of things that we are trying to do. Um, I know they're wanting to get the idea that Middlesbrough is the most creative town um, in the country. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how we're doing that. Uh, lots of stats and facts about numbers, pieces of art to population or something like that. But um, there's, it's a good place to be right now. Um, Middlesbrough, Teesside in general. Um, as an artist, um, we all work together as a group, as a community of, of kind of spaces, um, which we know is quite, it's not the same in like Newcastle and Leeds, we get lots of artists coming from those areas and, and, and they're kind of amazed by the fact that we all work together. So if we've got an opening and it's the same night as another gallery's got an opening, we'll stagger our openings so that people can go to all of the exhibitions that are on that night rather than competing against each other like, um, like they do up in Newcastle. So um, it's a really, it's, it's, it's one of those places where I don't think necessarily arts and culture has played a big role in the past. But certainly right now and going into the future, um, there is a lot of opportunities, a lot of um, funding opportunities, a lot of uh, spaces, a lot of artists and creatives who are, um, you know, starting to make Middlesbrough, Teesside their kind of home and, and have this, um, I don't know, trying to build this, this culture um, of creativity around the, what we already have so it, it is a it is an exciting place to to kind of be it as a moment as an artist um going back to kind of funding and and making money as an artist and stuff um i won't lie pineapple black we haven't had any funding since february 2020 um we weren't eligible for any recovery funding during the uh, covid and stuff um, and we struggled a bit getting funding since from the Arts Council. Um, but it's not stopped with. Um, me and Bobby both have our own practices outside of Pineapple Black. And Pineapple Black was always started um, by us with the idea that we would do it as long as it wasn't costing us money. And as of yet, it hasn't cost us any money. Um, but Bobby does... Um, he does a bit of lecture in at Teesside University, does some work at MEMA, does some stuff with um, Borderlands and, and, and projects around Teesside. Uh, and I'm uh, signed to a gallery in Miami and I work as a graffiti artist and send work over to America and it's all very strange and weird. But it means that we're able to just do Pineapple Back for the love of it. Um, and and I think that passion and that love kind of comes across by the amount of people that come and support and and, and help um, whenever we we need it. Um, That's yes. brilliant. Can we just um, open the floor up to some yes. questions from people? Um, I actually have a question. <laughs> Sorry, <straight> in there. <laughs> um, and I'm going to speak on behalf of. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to speak on behalf of because I know we've got some young artists in the group. Um, yeah. What's your application process like for people wanting to get work into your gallery? Um, you know, can anyone yeah. apply to have work in your gallery? You know, what? What's the... Well, I mean, it's 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 a very complicated process. 
um, we require you to send us an email saying, hi, can I have a show in your gallery? Um, preferably with some imagery and a little bit of an explanation of what that is. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, I think knowing ourselves, being artists um, and uh, applying to other places, um, especially big institutions and stuff, there's a lot of boxes to tick and, and hurdles to kind of jump over and stuff. And so we try and to we try and make it as, as easy as possible, basically, for anyone to, yeah. to come in and have a show. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it, it is just as simple as, hi, this is who I am, this is what I want to do. And then, you know, we'll get you in, we'll chat, Zoom call, whatever, find some dates, times that works for everybody and, um, and yeah. Yeah. hopefully get you in <laughs> oh brilliant um i can see in the chat there Anne has posted in there saying there's a similar space in carlisle and is that the same for where you're at um hi no i'm i'm actually based out uh on the west coast of cumbria in, in egremont at the art center um but it was just an observation having seen the space that creative port have in carlisle i'm sure you guys will have been there and, and know it too but for the benefit of those that don't they have a, that, well, they don't have the shop space, but there's a big shop space with that interesting changing room set up at the back with no curtains, but little booths. Um, it's got traffic because it's in the town centre, but they primarily work and function upstairs. Um, but it might just be nice in the interest of sharing best practice for the, the two of them to connect and, and sort of discuss how they use the space. Because mm. I think what Pineapple Black are doing sounds really exciting um, and it, it might support creative quarter on their journey on their, their visual the visual arts part of their journey anyway i can i can i can connect i am uh, for my sins i'm chair of carlisle culture and uh, um better quarter is in there so i can connect you with that Stephen. Uh, as the words the words um, i think it's great what you got there um i, I love that uh, a big thing of mine is cultural democracy which kind of is interesting goes through what richard does what bart does and you know that sort of thing that you kind of you know you almost you don't realize you've got a philosophy and then you realize that the, 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 the things that you like are all the same so you must have a philosophy and what i mean by that is making things really accessible to anyone it doesn't matter how much money you've got you can access richard's work Bart's work and stevens um and and the words my favorite words in there were it's right next door to primark um uh i, I was trying to get one in carlisle that's right next door to primark and and that was kind of why because you know for all it's this best, stuff that it's it's the best thing about it. I mean, we we know for a fact that um, we actually get more visitors per day than MIMA, which is the big Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art thing. You know, that's the, the big thing. We are the most visited art space in, in, in Middlesbrough because of the fact that it's so open. Like, it, it is, it's right there and it's got big glass front and it's got shutter doors that are open and no public can just walk past and see what it is that they're walking in. How many galleries, how many places that have you been to where you have to go through a door and a door and through a reception into the gallery space and you don't know what you're walking in. No public who doesn't engage with the arts on a regular basis, you know, that can be a scary place. You know, when we first opened, the amount of people that would come in going, oh, I've, you know, I've never been to me, ma'am, I don't normally go to an art gallery, but it's there. And, it, and it's gone to show over the years that there is an interest by Joe Public in the arts, in creativity. And yes, yes, we get the comments of some people as they walk past, you know, like kind of, oh, it's art, and stuff. But like me and Bobby like them probably more than we like the ones which are complimentary. Mm -hmm. It's kind of because, you know, like they might not like it or anything, but they're still looking at it. The, you know, they still walked past that window and have still looked at that artwork that's in that window. Whether or not they've enjoyed it or not, you know, but they've still engaged with it. And it's something that they wouldn't normally have done if we hadn't have been there. So If everyone likes it, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. So, Stephen, oh, just for the, yeah. uh, the benefit of the, the younger artists in the group who may want to, or actually any of the artists in the group who may want to be in contact with you, where's the best place to find you sort of online? Uh, I'm just trying to get a bit of light. There we go. Um, we are, I mean, Facebook, Instagram, Pineapple Black Arts, um, all one word. Uh, it's pretty much 
uh, is pretty much where you'll find her. Um, and if anyone is interested, we have an open call, which um, ends on the 30th of June, um, which you can find via our Facebook or on Curator Space. Um, so that's a, our summer open call, um, which is just, there's no, we don't have any rules or regulations on age or who you are. We don't even look at who, who you are when we um, look at the work. We just um, pick work based on work. So we just download all the images and just go through the images and go, yeah, we're like that, that. you know, like, um, so you've got just as much chance of being in the show if you've never been to as an art school or you've got six years of experience. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice way of doing it. Awesome. So um, very quickly, I'm going to introduce Celia Burbush. Now, Celia is the lead creative on the 66 stories. Um, Celia, could you fill us in with a bit of detail about the project and what it entails? Yeah. Oh, I'm getting reverb again. Right, can you hear me? <laughs> Brilliant. It's because me and Adrian are in the same room and it's popped us entirely. Um, yeah, I'll just be brief because I know you guys got to go. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, 66 Stories is happening um, in six districts across the 66 um, and they are, um, this has kind of come after about four years of work and so these districts are kind of partnering in with Eden Arts. Um, so we're working with, in terms of towns, Redcar, Darlington, Hartlepool, Middlesbrough, Penrith and Wigton. Um, and it's going to involve lots of commissions of various sizes and with an emphasis on young emerging artists but also more established artists um, in a kind of supportive mentoring kind of relationships but also then the main thing being um, listening and working with the stories of these communities um, and that's my background really it's kind of that sort of careful listening and processes to working with communities um, but it will be kind of, yeah, lots of different events happening over uh, the next few months, culminating probably around September. So just watch out for um, some of the opportunities coming along of varying types. And I just might be knocking on your door directly, actually, because it is a bit of matching art forms and ideas and ways of working with, with these communities. But um, also um, get in touch with me directly as well, celia.burbush at Eden Arts dot org or dot co dot, dot, dot co dot uk uh, just get in touch if you have got an idea in your area as well um, um or you know of a community because that'd be good to hear from me thank you very much perfect thank you celia so um we're going to end there uh, happy birthday tim <laughs> if he's listening happy birthday <laughs> tim <laughs> um i'm sorry for the I'm the guide to Kendall. And a massive thank you to Richard Barr and Pineapple Black Gallery and of course Celia. Uh, we're going to have more of these so we'll keep you all updated. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.